Hello and welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. This is program number 26 in our series in the Gospel of Mark. I love Mark. I love the stories. It is such a pleasure to do this. This is some of the easiest television I've ever done. I maybe have you maybe remember uh, doing the book of Revelation. It almost killed me. It was so difficult, but now I'm so pleased to be in Mark. And we have another wonderful story. This one in Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 31. It's a little short one. Uh, it's called Jesus Heals a Deaf Man. <coughs> Pardon me. Jesus Heals a Deaf Man. Can't hear. And it uh, reminds me of myself. Uh, tomorrow I have to go in to see an ear specialist. When I was a little boy, I had, my brother and I had uh, um, ear infections. We got our eardrums scarred. I can hear plenty well, volume-wise. The words get muddied, and people think, oh, well, you're just getting older. Well, I'm getting older, but it's been like this since I was a little kid. Uh, but it gets a little worse, and so I'm not a deaf man, but I would like to have had Jesus around. I could go say, hey, I'd like to have a, a little clearer hearing. Uh, and, uh, I, of course, I can do that. Uh, we can always pray and ask God for his healing. But here is the story of Jesus healing a deaf man. Now, why this story is in the New Testament at all is, is kind of a wonder. Because it doesn't seem to be that big a deal. Well, for people in that age, it was. Uh, there was no hearing aid. It, it may have meant that it, it was on the fringe of society, maybe was unable to work. Uh, who knows how it might have impacted him. But he had some friends. He had some friends that had heard about Jesus, that Jesus healed people, and so this person is going to meet him. Uh, <clears throat> people wonder, how can we meet Jesus today? Uh, we can uh, in two ways. One, by Scripture, reading the Scripture. Uh, <clears throat> when I was, before I was a Christian, I couldn't understand anything about the Bible. It even irritated me to think about the Bible. It irritated me to read it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't make any sense of it. I remember picking it up and it being it angering me. Figure that out. But after I became a Christian, that all changed. And from that day to this, I never put down the Bible. I love to read the Bible. I love to preach it. I love to teach it. I love to think about the words in it. It is marvelous, absolutely marvelous. And without that, a life would be empty of content, if nothing else. The Bible had deep content. We're not always on the surface of the newspapers and the headlines uh, on, on the news and the newest thing that whatever is going on. It gets old after a while. It's nothing new under the sun, but not the Bible, and particularly the Gospels. Absolutely wonderful. So I, it's my pleasure to be able to teach you the story of Jesus healing a deaf man. Now, it's going to take place in a different place in a different part of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the area of Israel or uh, Palestine today. Uh, it's in the Middle East. And Jesus had been up north, probably into what is now Lebanon. And his, he will have walked through their area into the area of what is now Syria and come down the other side into what is called a Decapolis, probably not all the way to what is now Jordan. But perhaps to an area called the Decapolis, Deca, ten polis cities, the ten cities. They were built uh, by Rome, uh, and one of the reasons they built these cities was to have um, places for their retired army troops to settle in and live in. The, the Romans did this constantly on the frontiers, particularly. They would build cities or areas of unrest. They would settle. Uh, whole thousands and thousands of retired um, uh, army Roman, uh, Roman soldiers. 
And so the Decapolis was an area of 10 Greek cities. And they had a lot of ex-military there. So here we go. Uh, verse 31, chapter 7. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. One thing I learned about trying to figure out these areas is names and places would change from time to time. Uh, there would be a little shifting. Uh, what was now the area of Sidon is someplace a little bit different or it encompassed either a larger area or a smaller area of consideration. Uh, there was a, some fluidity throughout history in regards to the names of some of these places. But we do know the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis. So uh, let me see if I've got anything else on that. Okay, verse 32. And they brought to him a man who was deaf. Now we always have to ask questions like, who's they? One of the fun things is to ask questions. We sometimes assume too much. You, you see the book, uh, the, the verse 32 on your screen, in the lower thirds, and it says, and they, you have to ask the hard questions. Who's they? Well, what are the possible answers? People who lived in that area, or it could be the disciples. Some commentators will say one, some another. We're not going to ever know because this, the, the, the passage doesn't tells us tell us explicitly who the they is. So all we can do is speculate. And if I'm going to speculate, I'm going to think it is the people in that area, in that area of the Decapolis. Uh, Jesus was known widely. I believe he had been in this area before. The Gadarene demoniac, sort of in that area. So word could have spread. But I think the they is not the disciples because I think if Mark wanted us to know it was the disciples, he would have just added the disciples. But the they, I think, probably refers to the people who lived in that area. By the way, there are so many points in the scripture that they could go either way, and it really doesn't, doesn't make any difference at all. But we do enjoy our speculating. Anyhow, so they brought to him, and that's the whole thing. They brought to him. Key little passage that I'm going to talk about a little bit. I'm, I'm reading a book. Actually, I finished it last night called Evangelism in the Early Church by Michael Green, um, an Oxford Don or Oxford Fellow, um, member of the Anglican Church, who wrote the book originally in 1970 and became of note because he was a charismatic Anglican. And he rewrote the book in 2003. And currently, it's the book you'll be giving away to every buddy at Miller Avenue Church who has a birthday in 2016. Uh, I think it's in the top three books I've ever read, and I can't tell you the names of the other two. This is how highly I think of this book. It is wonderfully written all about the first two centuries of the Christian era. And in that book, Michael Green says the early church did three things. See, what I'm doing is I'm getting an opportunity to give this to you uh, because I think it is so vital. And by the way, you can get this on Amazon.com. Uh, the, uh, the, the classic edition is only $85, the hardback. Uh, you can get them for around $30. Get a used copy. It's okay. But it probably will be one of the best books in your library that you could possibly have there. But he says the early church did three things in how they presented who they were. He said, first of all, they preached the person. That means the person of Christ. And when we talk about the person of Christ, it involves two things. Who Jesus is and what Jesus did who Jesus is, and what Jesus did. That's called preaching the person or preaching Jesus. God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God come to be with us, the Redeemer, the Savior. 
what he did, died on a cross, taking our sin upon himself, dying in our place, being buried, being risen from the dead, and ascending to the right hand of the Father on high. That is the person and work of Jesus, and that's what the early church did. They focused on that. This was their focus. Now, the second thing Michael Green says that they preached was they preached a gift. That's the word he uses, a gift. And by that he means grace. Grace is, well, the classical definition that you'll hear is unmerited favor. In other words, it's giving the ultimate gift that can never be earned by the person who receives it. It is the gift of, first of all, the complete forgiveness of sin, forgiveness of past, present, and future sins, all sins, even the dumb ones, the deliberate ones, the awful ones, the stinky, naughty ones, all of our sin. Jesus took upon himself. He forgives us freely as a gift. We can't earn it. can't be earned. I mean, what are you going to do? How you, how you, what, what are you going to do to appease a God who is holy and says not? That is sin. You, you, you can't appease that God. You can't do enough good. How could you do that? No. So they preached the gift or grace. So they preached the person and work of Jesus that salvation is by grace. It's not by joining a church. It's not by being baptized. It's not by anything you can possibly do. Now third, and you'll think, well, oh, what are you talking about? Third is they expected a response. They expected a response. Now, by the response, what was it? When you look at the book of Acts, very simple, to be baptized. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were converted. They were baptized that day. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, he said they passed a body of water. Here's some water. What prevents me from being baptized? Philip obviously told him about baptism. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, then we find Paul uh, in Philippi and Lydia, Lydia from Thyatira. She became a believer in Jesus. She was baptized that day. The same chapter, Acts 16, the Philippian jailer, he was converted. He was baptized that day. Earlier, we have Cornelius and Peter at Caesarea. Cornelius becomes a Christian and, and his household, and they were baptized then. The early Christians did not think that baptism was something that saved you. Make that clear. Not something that saved you. But it's something that Jesus said to do. Matthew chapter 28, 17, 18, 19. Um, he said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said to do it, so we've been doing it ever since. In the Jesus People movement, it was incredible. How many hundreds of people we baptized? Uh, it, was, it was incredible. I remember times walking back late at night in 1968 from the Haight-Ashbury to the outer Richmond district, 42nd and Balboa, and having with us people who were brand new Christians. You know what happened several times? They wanted to go right down to the ocean, but nine blocks down, and be baptized. I remember going down there, 11 or 12 o'clock at night, Walked out there in our clothes, baptized them. The ocean was making too much noise to say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Baptize them. And squeaky, wet shoes and clothes all the way back up and uh, changed clothes. And that, they wanted to be baptized. They wanted to be baptized right away. And so the early church expected a response. After a while, people had the idea that the church had the power to save and forgive sin and wash away sin by baptism. Not biblical, sorry, I'm sorry. If it were not so, I would not have said so, but that's the way it is. You know what, I better get into the story before it's too late, right? I wonder how many were thinking about that. What happened to Philpot? Anyway, so, and they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. Now the speech impediment, uh, you, well, you can well imagine if you've not heard words, uh, it would be very difficult to know how to speak. You wouldn't know how to make the correct sound. You wouldn't have no feedback. So, and it says, and they begged. 
they begged him. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's the people of town, not, not the disciples. Because the disciples would merely have presented the man and said, Lord, would you, would you do something about this man's condition? Here, they begged him. They were uncertain as to whether he would do it. That he could do it, they had no question. But that he would is hard to know. Uh, now, remember, we're in the area of the Decapolis, probably a Gentile, probably a Gentile. So he's going to ministering to one group of Gentiles to another group of Gentiles. This guy could have been a retired Roman soldier. Who knows? They begged him to lay his hand on him, to lay his hand. The Jewish people had long associated the touch, the laying on of hand with the anointing of kings and of prophets, and they associated it with the hand of God. This, was, this is how you, you brought the idea that we are asking God to do something here. Uh, it was by the laying on of hands, still practiced today. We do it at Miller Avenue Church. So, and it says, and taking him aside from the crowd privately. So they're begging him to do this, but he doesn't do it right away. Not it right away. For reasons that are unexplained, you might speculate it was for an opportunity to minister more personally to this guy, or to keep from embarrassing him, or more probably that it wouldn't excite the crowd into running around saying, the healer's here, the healer's here, and everybody descend on him. Remember, this is the era of the retirement ministry with Jesus. He's wanting to spend time with his disciples. And anything that would attract a large crowd was not something he really wanted. So maybe it's that he wanted it to be private. And it may be in uh, any combination of these as well. So taking him aside from the crowd privately, he, he put his fingers into his ears. Fingers into his ears. Well, he couldn't, if he said, be healed, well, that would have worked. But he wanted the man to understand what was going on. If He, he couldn't hear. So he wouldn't have been able to hear Jesus say, <clears throat> uh, be healed. Not that he didn't have to hear that to bring about the healing. That wasn't required. But uh, he, he, he sticks his fingers in his ears. Interesting. Can you, can you picture Jesus doing that? And, and after spitting, touch his tongue. So he does this, spits on his hand. He's, he spit on his hand. Jesus has spit on his own fingers, his own hand. Touches the man's tongue. <coughs> <coughs> I'm just getting over some kind of a bug. Okay. Anyway. Uh, spitting touched his tongue. Interesting. Why did Jesus do that? Doesn't that seem a little crazy? Was all of that necessary? Well, you'd have to say that for this particular man, it was necessary. Probably we would have had to have known the case, have examined that, understood what the man had been through. And what maybe the guy was thinking in his heart and in his mind that was, was happening to him. But I am trusting that Jesus knew what he was doing. He took the man's peculiar and particular situation into account and ministered to this guy in the way that he needed to. It's not stated in the passage, but because of the unusual nature of Jesus' action, uh, we can perhaps assume that he had reason to do exactly what he did. In verse 34, he says, And looking up to heaven, I don't know where it was in the history of Christianity that we, we do this. But that's what we do. Uh, I don't remember in a church, in an evangelical church or a Catholic church or any kind, where people did this, but that's how the early Jewish people did it. They lifted up their hands, eyes open, they looked up, 
to the creator of heaven and earth, they looked up, not down, up, for whatever reason, but it's natural to go up, and make their prayer. I don't know the history of that. Maybe somebody would communicate that to me. That'd be interesting. When in the history of the church did this transition take place? But it obviously did. And looking up to heaven, he sighed. Now, again, whenever we interpret this passage as like this, you have, to, you have to look at each word, each little phrase. He sighed. He sighed. Here we have the, the subject and the verb. And then in a minute, we're going to get to the direct object, actually indirect object. He sighed. Why, why he sighed, we don't know. Um, an emotional thing? Probably. Uh, I kind of think that maybe he thought about the circumstances that us humans face. Um, the philosopher, Spanish philosopher Unamuno's famous book called The Tragic Sense of Life, I think Jesus was very much aware of the tragic sense of life, the human struggle, the human angst, the pain, the suffering, the grief. I think Jesus knew about it and knew about it better than we'll ever know about it. We find Jesus sighing and crying at different points. The shortest verse in the Bible is, he wept. Everybody knows that one. He wept, uh, having to do with his friend's Lazarus' death and the mourning that went on. And he sighed. Again, I'd like to be able to picture that. I, I, I feel that he had a sense of uh, the, the tragedy of life, of human life. The, um, the, the pain of our, our, our being here on this planet. What being exposed to that which is unclean and not being holy in the presence of God, I think, weighed heavily upon him. I think that that's what propelled and compelled Jesus to go to the cross so that we might ultimately be free from all that which is evil and awful and murderous and, and lies uh, encrusted in, 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 to free us from that. I think he had a sense of that. Here was this man. We don't know his age. We don't know the circumstances of his life, what had transpired for this man. Couldn't have been good. And I think that Jesus had a sense of that. You know, we find many times where it, the word compassion is used in regard to Jesus. He had compassion on them. We find several times in the scripture. We're going to find it in the story um, next week, by the way, too, in the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus had compassion. We don't find him ever rejecting anybody. We don't find him ever judging anybody. But we do find him sighing, being merciful, having compassion, healing, making whole. We find that in Jesus. We never find anything else. Interesting, isn't it? And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, he said to him, Epatha, I can't pronounce this word, E-P-H-P-H-A-T-H-A, -H -A -H -A, Epatha, okay, as close as I'm ever going to get, Epatha, that is, and it was an Aramaic word, and he gives us the, the Greek word, which means in English, be opened. Be opened. Okay? And his ears were open. So all of a sudden he could hear. His ears was open, were opened. His tongue was released. And he spoke plainly. Now, when someone hears their first word, you've seen it on television perhaps, there's a process. It, it doesn't happen really quickly. Sometimes you have to be very careful not to stun the individual by all of a sudden the sound 
I've seen all kinds of t programs like this, people hearing their first words after an operation or something. Well, one of the big parts of the miracle is, is that he spoke plainly. He spoke plainly. Verse 36, and Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Now, you got to ask yourself, why is it that Jesus wanted the guy to be quiet about this? Notice the double miracle. He could, he could hear and he could speak. Everything happened. We don't know how these, uh, these diseases were related, whether it was having to do with accident, disease, who knows? We don't know. Congenital, who knows? We'd have no idea. But in any case, the man's healed. First thing we find that Jesus says, he charged them. Notice, he charged them to tell no one. And then it says, but the more he charged them, in other words, Jesus was doing this. He charged them. Now there's his friends that have begged him, that brought him. And all of a sudden, the big hoopla is going to go up. Everybody's excited. Wow! Maybe it was a brother. Maybe it was a father. Maybe it was a son. Maybe it's good friends, neighbors. We don't know. But it must have been very exciting. And so Jesus is charging them, not just once or twice, he's charging them. He says, and Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, Jesus, it wasn't working. He's sort of, he's upping it. Be more demonstrative, more stern. The more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Sounds like when somebody becomes a Christian, doesn't it? That's what happens to us. It's interesting, the developmental process, the spiritual development of a Christian. Early excitement. Then you go through <coughs> sometimes some, some rough spots. Go through some very rough spots. But anyway, here is at the beginning, and as excited as many of us have been. Verse 37, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying, beyond measure, the words that he uses, beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. There's a song that says, Jesus doeth all things well. Jesus doeth all things well. That's what you find out as a Christian. He does everything well. May not seem so all the time, but in historical perspective, he does all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now this guy has something to say. And he goes about saying it. That's the story of Christianity. Before we had nothing of real interest to say, but after we become Christians, now we have something plenty interesting to say. So long.